Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your hot takes, observations, questions, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. Over 24 hours ago, I posted on the YouTube community tab, which is normal. But this week, I got Twitter involved, which I don't do every week, at Gil underscore Gross. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, and Twitter kind of popped off, so I got a ton of comments this week in total. I pulled 25. Uh, I don't think I'll get, I know I won't get to all 25. I'm going to go 45 minutes this week. All right, let's see how that works out. Let's see how that works out this week. Let's get going. First one is from Vikash, and it's a double whammy, a two-parter. Part one, in light of Simo's public outreach, do you think the Players' Council on both tours have largely failed in their roles? I have never seen a visible stand by them on any matter. So, uh, backstory on this. Simona Halep has taken to social media and basically uh, and did an interview, I believe, with tennis majors to publicly complain about the process that has taken place over the course of the last eight months since she failed a drug test. Now, the regular protocol is when you fail a drug test, you get a provisional suspension. You get a chance to then appeal your, your penalty or, or your suspension and then you have a, a hearing. You, you, have a, you submit the evidence and you have a hearing. It has been a, a long time since Halep has submitted her evidence and the hearing continues to be delayed and delayed and delayed. Halep has, has been vocal about, about why she feels that that's unfair. I think she's completely right. I totally agree with her. I totally agree with her. How can you provisionally suspend someone and then not give them a verdict in a timely matter. This is the, a, a basic part of any fair justice system. Now, in this case, we're not talking about criminal justice. We are talking about uh, doping, you know, drug testing and, and keeping a sport clean. But I think the same principles hold up regardless. If you are going to put someone in a, a holding period, you, you need to come to a resolution. Guilty, not guilty, whatever the, the result is going to be, you need to come to that result in a timely manner if you're going to use provisional suspensions. I think Halep is claiming that she took a tainted supplement and her evidence for that is the amount of drug, the amount of steroid that was uh, detected. It's actually not a steroid, so I'm, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's basically the equivalent of blood doping. Uh, it, it, I think it improves the oxygen, uh, the number of like white blood cells in your, in your blood. Uh, it's the thing that was popular in cycling, I believe, to improve your cardio. That's what she tested positive for. She's claiming a tainted supplement. She's saying that the amount was so little that obviously I wasn't doping as a means to enhance my performance. And uh, I, I think that that's the evidence that she submitted. So I'm, I'm totally with her. But the question is not about if Halep has a right to complain here. The question is about the Players' Council. And uh, frankly, I'm not positive about how it works on the WTA Tour, but I know on the ATP Tour, the Players' Council is no substitution for a Players' Association or a Players' Union or anything of the sort. The Players' Council, basically, the power that they have is they get one vote. They get one vote in the board, you know, on the board. And as far as I'm concerned, that is their power. That is far, far, far less power than a actual United Players Association should have or could have. In a, in a normal sport, let's take basketball. And by the way, I have a great example. It's something that happened recently. Uh, in the NBA, the National Basketball Association, the players wanted cannabis to be legalized. Uh, because in the United States, a lot of states legalized weed. But the players in the NBA still couldn't smoke weed because it was part of their drug testing protocol in the NBA that, that weed was a banned substance. The Players Association uh, obviously took the temperature of the players that they represented and they uh, identified that the players would like that to change. So in the collective bargaining agreement where the Players Association negotiates with the league, they said, hey, one of our conditions, one of the things we want changed is we want marijuana to be taken off of the banned substance lists. And the players got their wish. That is how 
this should work. That is how if the PTPA uh, succeeds in their mission to give the players uh, bargaining power to actually be a, a powerful body that represents the players, uh, that is what a successful PTPA would look like. So let's see if they can get it done. It's hard in individual sports. Uh, you guys know that I follow MMA very carefully. There have been numerous attempts to unionize the fighters or, or uh, bring the fighters under one umbrella, under one association, so that the fighters can have more power. By the way, uh, MMA fighters are exploited far worse than tennis players are in terms of pay. Uh, there have been many attempts to do that and all have failed. So it is an uphill battle, but this is the kind of thing, what Simona Halep is going through, this is the kind of thing where the players should have bargaining power to negotiate how these drug testing protocols and systems work. And if those systems are not fair to the players, a strong players association would be able to uh, negotiate and ultimately hold out. That That's the, the power that the players association has, the ATP Players Council at least, they have one vote. That's not a lot of power. What power does the NBA Players Association have? A strike. They get to hold out if they don't get what they want. That is real power. That's organization that can make a difference. All right, long answer, but I thought that was interesting. Uh, second one, WTA players are more hostile towards Russia, Belor Belarus, uh, sorry, Belarus uh, than on ATP. What are your thoughts? Okay, so essentially, why has there been so much friction on the WTA tour between uh, Ukrainian players and Russian Belar Belarusian players versus on the ATP tour. We haven't seen that as much. I, I think your simple answer is there aren't really any prominent Ukrainian players on uh, at the ATP level who are playing week in and week out. So who's to say that if, I don't know, Sergei Stakhovsky was still an active player on the ATP tour, or he, let's say he was a top 50 player, who's to say that there wouldn't be some, some friction emerging uh, in certain points? So that's your simple answer, right? You have Lisa Tsarenko, you have Marta Kostyuk, uh, you have, you have uh, other Ukrainian players on the WTA tour. So that's part of it. Uh, you also have more Russian and Belarusian players on the WTA tour. And on the ATP side of things, at least when it comes to the top players, Andrei Rublev has done, in my opinion, everything he can, everything you can expect a player to do he has done in terms of uh, sympathy, which I think is the biggest, the biggest thing that you can ask is, is just be sympathetic towards the situation, uh, show sorrow for, for what's happening. And, and I think Rublev has done that. I think Medvedev has done that. Uh, Karen Hatchinov, I haven't heard or seen anything on his end, but what I do know is that he's one of the most liked players in the entire locker room. He is just has an unbelievable reputation of, uh, of being a, a super, super kind uh, guy. So maybe another part of it is that the, the three guys who kind of hold the torch for the Russians on the ATP tour are just three guys who have been, I don't know, very pretty classy about, about it all. Not, you know, not saying that there's more that can be done. Yes, there's always more that can be done, but I also think that, uh, as I've said in the past, I think some understanding needs to be needs to be offered when it comes to players who have families in Russia and you know fearing uh, potential repercussions. So I, I feel like Rublev and, and Medvedev in particular have gone as far as they can be expected to go. Next one is from Srihari. Speaking of Medvedev, statistically, this has been Medvedev's best start to a season. He has uh, been rejuvenated since the Australian Open loss, and he'll play. And since he'll play Wimbledon this year, I think he's a top contender. The Hercotch loss in 2021 was bizarre, and had he won, he likely would have made the final. Thoughts? All right. In general, I agree. And I, I've said in the past, many, many years now, that I think Medvedev can be a contender at Wimbledon. I think there's a lot of parts of his game that should be successful or should uh, be aided by the grass. In terms of the Hercotch loss in 2021, though, I understand why you're saying it's bizarre. You're saying it's bizarre because there was a rain delay. Uh, Medvedev was up two sets to love. Then it was pushed to the next day. And the next day, Hercotch came back to win the, the final three sets. I hope I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, so I understand why you're saying it's bizarre. On the other hand, what's not bizarre is that Hercotch is a terrific net rusher. 
and Medvedev was not adjusting his court position and Hercotch was taking advantage of those two things and Hercotch has the skills to take advantage of those things. And that's the concern with Medvedev on grass. You cannot rely on your defense as much on grass. You're not going to move as well. You're not going to defend as well. So Medvedev's return strategy of getting a lot of returns back in play, but being in a in a court position that's going to require a lot of defense in the, you know, at least for the first couple of shots, oftentimes, you know, that's that could be a problem. I think in general, Medvedev needs to be more offensively minded in order to have success on grass. And that's going to start with the return of serve. That said, the backhand is tailor-made for grass. It's going to stay so low. It's going to be so tough to attack. Obviously, he brings the big serve to the table. Uh, I love his depth. I thought he was moving pretty comfortable in, comfortably in the lead-up to Wimbledon last year. And ultimately, Medvedev on any fast court surface has been phenomenal. So why can't that translate to grass? Just got to be a little bit more offensive, I think. Uh, and then I think he'll, he'll do great. All right, this was the top liked comment on YouTube. Came from Nicholas, who is a member. Appreciate everyone who is a member, and I try to get to those comments. Um, you can hit the join button. It is $2 a month, and it is uh, much appreciated. Question is, which player currently uh, aged 23 to 28 could you possibly see pulling off a Vavrinka? In other words, unlocking a whole new potential in their late 20s and going on a Grand Slam winning spree around 30. Because this comment got so many likes, I did take the time to scroll through the rankings and make sure that I have an answer that I feel good about. And one name jumped off the page. One name I was like, yup, that's the one. It is Denis Shapovalov. That's my Vavrinka candidate. If someone is going to pop off, win three slams, because by the way, this is hard. You know, Vavrinka is not a normal case. Generally, if you are not contending for majors by the time you're 25, I got news for you. Ain't going to happen. Sorry, not going to happen. Uh, but team managed to make some big improvements. And, and I think he had kind of a, a, a situation where he was playing his best, the best tennis of his life by far at 27, 28. Uh, when I was going through the rankings, Shapovalov was the name that stood out to me because there's a lot of parallels that I see. You have big power off the ground, brilliant arm talent when it comes to ball striking, but there are, I, th I think, questions with the motivation, the fire, the drive, the killer instinct. I think Stan really suffered from that. My impressions watching young Vavrinka, and, and granted, I was pretty, you know, he's 37 years old, so I don't know, you kind of do the math. When he was a, a, a youngster on the tour, I don't really remember that version of Stan Vavrinka all that well, but, you know, 20, 2011 forward, I, I do, and I don't know that Stan had, as Mary Carrillo would say, fangs. He seemed pretty content with where he was at in his career, and he dug in physically started playing uh, percentages, making more balls, maintaining his offensive style, still hitting the cover off the ball, crushing off of both wings, but just doing so uh, directionally and when it came to his targets, doing so in a way that was allowing him to also be a consistent baseliner. And he started to really embrace the physical side of things. And also, he started blocking returns. And maybe Shapo could benefit from that as well. So the more I think about it, the more I, uh, I like that comparison because, you know, here's a guy with the talent to do it and just doesn't have it together. Maybe he can pull it together. There's another comment about Chapo later on in the mailbag that I might get to. All right. Next one is from Sam, another member. Hey Gil, what was your take on the team match? If you saw any of it, do we dare revive any hope? I feel like hardly anyone could beat Steph when he was, uh, having the best serving day of his or anyone's career. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a positive. It's a positive for team, I would say. He is, I, I really like his intention recently. Meaning when he is, sees a short ball and he has it, he's recognizing it, and 
he has bad intentions in what meaning you know he's looking to build and finish he's recognizing that he needs to attack and he's taking hard swings at the ball on his forehand side that's what was really missing when it looked really really bad uh in south america and over the course of the sunshine double where team was just not going after the ball at all and now he's starting to do that i still think he's missing uh a little bit of speed a little bit of spin but not all that much and look the first step was always going to be like as long as team is is trying to do the right things on the court i can have hope as long as he's doing those things uh where i was starting to lose hope is when he wasn't even attempting to play the brand of tennis that he needs to play uh Tsitsi pass i watched the highlights of this match i couldn't watch the match unfortunately but yeah, I mean, Tsitsipas, part of his his great serving in the second set resulted in a 6-1 set. So, you know, you can't give team all that much credit for that. But in the third set, the great serving from Tsitsipas continued and team was able to hang in there. Unfortunately for team, you know, it, we're, we're still in a situation where a lot of his most encouraging results uh, of the year are our losses but this was a step in the right direction you can revive hope you know it certainly looks a lot better than it did a few or, or several weeks ago so i think that's a good thing this next one is from adarsh what do you think of alcaraz's struggles in his first match of any tournament last year his uh four out of 13 losses were in the first round corda paul faa at davis cup and gafan even in wins some of his performances were subpar, but his opponents maybe not quite as good. This year, I think he has improved, but I still think he needs more time to adapt to conditions than most top players. Yeah, this may be true. Uh, this may be true because remember, Alcaraz's plan A is going to be a pretty high-risk style. He's going to go after his shots uh, to a high degree of difficulty. He is going to try to be in charge and, and dictate. And if you don't have a good feel for the conditions and if you don't have your best timing or your sharpest footwork that is going to result in errors and that is why you know the more error prone you are the more upset prone you are going to be there's a reason why if you take someone as consistent as i don't know jaume munar he you know basically doesn't lose to anyone outside the top 100 but he basically doesn't beat anyone inside the top 50. I'm just going to an extreme example here because consistency uh, consistency is going to require a certain level from your opponent, a high level from your opponent. Inconsistency, that is where you have uh, players who can play down to their opponents. And that's what uh, we saw at times with Alcaraz last year, uh, definitely in the quarter match, um, definitely in, you know, I mean, some of these, these are good players, Tommy Paul, FAA, Gafan. Uh, but yeah, in general, I think Alcaraz has improved in this area where I think if he's not feeling it, if he is making a, a ton of unforced errors, he's making the adjustment and playing higher percentages, going bigger targets, going cross court more, uh, playing with a little bit more topspin and net clearance at times instead of flattening the ball out. And that's why I think this year he has not lost early at all. His loss comes in the final against Nori and in the semifinal against Yannick Sinner. And that's it. So I think he's made an adjustment here. From Cobra. Thank you for the kind words. Why do you think Aslan Karatsev's level fell off for an extended period of time? And if Madrid is any indication, now appears to have recovered. He basically came out of nowhere, was unstoppable for a year or a little bit more, and he has barely a winning ATP level for matches in the past year plus. When I watched him, he was tremendously inconsistent and seemed to be lacking the power off the ground that allowed him to blow out top players from the baseline during his run to the top 15. Confidence, undisclosed injury, other, thanks. Okay, first of all, you're asking me to explain Aslan Karatsev, and I understand why. 
that's kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to these mailbags. You guys think of something confusing and then you ask me. Not always, but sometimes that's how it works. Well, guess what? I'm confused too a lot of the times. And Aslan Karatsev makes little sense. Now, when he had the surge that you're talking about, end of 2020, beginning of 2021, the one thing you could point to and kind of explain from it is, okay, well, we had this funky thing happen. This funky thing happened where we didn't play tennis for three to four months. I forget how long the pause was, but because of the pandemic, everybody just stopped playing for three or four months. Okay? That explains it. That's for some reason, Karatsev at 27 years old in 2020, that's what he needed for everything to click in his career. And like, does that, is that a one plus one equals two situation? No, but it is a feasible explanation for why Karatsev went on a tear. And on a tear he went because from August 2020 to Belgrade, which I guess was in April 2021, the results were unbelievable. They were at a top 15 level. And you know me, I I'm wary of sample size. Like when Borna Chorich had that massive Cincinnati, like when he won Cincinnati, I was like, all right, this is awesome. Maybe he'll continue doing these kinds of things, but maybe not. It's just one tournament. So let's see what happens. I'm, I'm big into that. With Karatsev, he had me fooled because the sample size was actually quite a bit at that point. He was tearing up challengers at the end of 2020, which is why he was my dark horse coming into the Australian Open. And then he made the semifinals and then he won Dubai. I think he beat Rublev in that tournament. I think he beat Hachinov, won Dubai, and then he beat Djokovic in Belgrade, made the final there. So we had a significant sample size. And then Karatsev, from that point on, he did win Sydney. That was the, the lone high point. He really fell off, really, really fell off hard last year after winning Sydney. I, I think his win percentage was around 33%. So far below 500 on tour. And now here in Madrid, uh, you know, his, his form wasn't so good. And he is in the semis, came through qualifying. So, look, I don't know. And especially because he's not the most expressive guy in interviews. He, he, doesn't, say, he doesn't say anything in interviews. So he, he doesn't help us out in that respect at all. Um, he did say, he did say in, in uh, press recently that there were some personal things happening. So, okay. Uh, might've been some stuff going on behind the scenes that was affecting his game. Uh, there was also last year, he, he was, he is in a match fixing scandal, which it's the kind of thing, you know, everything moves so slow in tennis. Uh, it, it pops up, it, I think like in Rotterdam last year, uh, that he is under investigation. So I don't know what's going on with that. I haven't heard anything, but that's another thing that's kind of hovering in the background for Karatsev. And in terms of his tennis, uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Karatsev, obviously ultra hyper aggressive style. Same thing that I just talked about with Alcaraz, obviously to a different level and under different circumstances. But for Karatsev, it's the same thing. It, it, when, when you make errors at the rate Karatsev was making errors, you can lose to anybody. You can lose to players who are far less talented than you are. That's what was happening. So yeah, the, the inconsistency was through the roof. And you know, it got to the point where it's like, okay, well, if you're not gonna make a ball, I don't know what there is to analyze here. That's kind of from my perspective, uh, what it came to, but, uh, Look, I'm, I'm glad to see him making a great run here. And, and the, the level is awesome that he's playing. I don't quite understand it though. You know, it's just the aggression is finding the court. And I, maybe I'm missing something here, but that's all I can say at this time. Next one is from member Glevum. Oh, okay. This is a question. I'm not even gonna read the question because it's, it's also about Karatsev. Uh, it basically says, uh, do you consider Karatsev's style a benefit or a hindrance considering his high risk nature? It seems as though uh, if he is in good form, he can beat anyone, sometimes look unstoppable, but his form drops 
and he can hardly string together consecutive wins. Yeah, I, I guess another guy kind of like this is Basilashvili, who's, who's been similar in his career. Basilashvili is the hardest hitter on tour. If you, I think if you combine his forehand and backhand averages, backhand usually hardest on tour, forehand top 10, top 5-ish, and Basilashvili is another guy. It's like he's either winning a title or he can't win a, a first-round match. Recently, it's been the latter, I think. I don't know what his ranking's at, but it's, it's ugly. I'm going to check out of curiosity. What is Basilashvili's ranking at today? He just lost first round at a challenger in Cagliari, and he's 138 in the world. Yet, here's a guy with what? How many titles to his name? Five. My God, five titles. Do you know how many great players retire and, and they don't have five titles? Damn, Basilashvili. He's another guy like Karatsev. It's weird. It's hard to figure out. Uh, but, but do I think his style is a benefit or a hindrance? Probably a benefit, honestly. I don't know how he was playing from age 20 to age 26, but I'm guessing, if I were to guess, he was less aggressive. And, you know, he's, he's got, he, he's a good athlete, you know, but he's not the best mover and he doesn't defend that well. So I, I think it's probably good that, that he plays the style that he plays. I don't think he has the, the capability. The players, I'll say this, the, there are players who I get frustrated with. I say, you're too aggressive. You'd be better if you were less aggressive. That, there are some players who I kind of pin that on. I just talked about one earlier in the mailbag, Shapovalov. I think Shapovalov should always be an aggressive player, but not this aggressive. Why? Because he's a really good athlete. He moves well. He can be explosive in, in his movement around the court. And I think he can have, if he trains the right way, I think he, he has the ability probably to uh, become a, a pretty good, you know, decent defender. Uh, Alejandro Davidovich Fakina, top 10, if not top five mover in the sport. So for him, yeah, all the time, I'm like, why are you playing so aggressive? You should use your legs. Karatsev is not in that mold. He's not a player who moves so well where, where his aggression frustrates me. That said, does he, you know, do I think he, would I like him to be a little bit more like Andre Rublev and find a way to be aggressive without missing so much? Yeah, in an ideal world, yeah. Next one is from Anastasia or Anastasia. Could go either way. Two-week Masters 1000s. In the long run, isn't this beneficial to the field and players' longevity, especially if events are properly scheduled for those that lose in the first week? I see. So, like, especially if you give players an option to play the next week at, like, a 250 or a challenger. Sure. All right. Lots of buzz on social media over the course of Madrid. Not positive. Maybe that's just because the internet is going to internet and, you know, most people, when they like stuff, they don't say anything. But when they don't like stuff, they become very talkative on the internet. Maybe that's why. But as far as I can tell, the two-week Masters format is not very popular. That said, it is something that everyone will get used to. You know, Three years from now, nobody's going to be talking about this. So while, while I think we should talk about, now, uh, talk about it now, well, I think maybe, you know, I, it's definitely worth discussing. It is going to fade into the distance. You will forget it was ever a thing. That is how these things work. Now, this is an interesting angle. You're asking, it, are players going to basically hold up physically better in this format? And I see what you're saying. At face value, when you're playing best of three matches with a day off in between, that is your ideal format. You know, that is a restful format. I do think there are some additional challenges though that the format poses that uh, that should be considered. Mental health, you know, how, how might it wear on you mentally? Because, and, and I know you kind of mentioned it here, if you lose first round, you are twiddling your thumbs for about two weeks. And 
there isn't really an event for you to play that second week. If you're far away from home, you know, you're not going to travel. If you're a European and you lose in Indian Wells, you're not going back to Europe and vice versa. If you're an American and you lose early in Madrid, you're not going back to the States. So there are some challenges here with, you know, I, I think mentally, uh, with kind of waiting around, not being able to compete as much as you would want to compete. Let us go to Tom. Hi, Gil. Something I've been mulling over for a while now. Would going to one serve only improve the game? And who would be the big winners slash losers if this were to happen? Something so far-fetched that, you know, this, this conversation is just for fun, right? It'll never happen. It's just not what tennis is. In tennis, you get two serves and... It's like literally just part of the fabric of what the sport is. But I have played one serve tennis in training and I encourage, I encourage you to try it. If you would like to practice your second serve and you want a fun way to do it, that isn't sitting at the baseline with a hopper of balls and hitting kick serve after kick serve after kick serve. I have an idea, play a set, play a set against a friend, against a training partner and just do one serve. And it's, a, I think, a really fun and beneficial exercise. Would it improve tennis as a spectator sport? Look, I don't know, but there are arguments there. Look, I like the chess of first serve, second serve. I think, you know, it, it, it brings something fantastic to tennis. This, again, this, this chess match, this, uh, variation between different points and how we can dissect the, the differences between uh, the, the multiple dynamics that take place because there are two serves. But uh, if there was only one serve, you would get more rallies and that would speed up tennis substantially. It would, it would do far more to speed up the game than any of the other things that have been implemented by the tourists to speed up the game, including serve clock and limiting uh, medical timeouts and bathroom breaks and, and all of those things. It would do far more. Obviously, it would improve anybody who wins baseline rallies at an elite level. I still think big servers, like I still think an, uh, an Isner or an Opelka or a Berrettini, I still think their serve would come into play as a strength. I don't think it would completely neutralize that, but it, it would take something away from those guys, no doubt about it. And it would really help uh, anyone who, you know, just doesn't have much of a first serve and makes their living from winning rallies. And and those are players like Yoshi Nishioka and Diego Schwartzman and Davidovich Fikina. Um, yeah, players like like that would, would stand to benefit. Honestly, I think, I mean, in the big three, Djokovic and Nadal would benefit, Federer would not. Murray would benefit, except Murray, that, then you have some nuance there because Murray's first serve was much better than his second serve. His second serve was kind of a weakness. His first serve was actually pretty good. All right, enough on that. From New Day, what do you think is the matter with Shapovalov? His getting rid of old, of solid coaches and settling for what's comfortable strikes me a little like the phase Zverev went through with the likes of Lendl and Juan Carlos Ferrero. If he approached you to get him back on track, what changes would you make? So Shapovalov, just for some background info, Shapovalov is currently being coached by Peter Polanski, who, you know, has gone straight from playing to coaching Shapo, and obviously they have a, a very, you know, friendly relationship. Uh, and the previous coaches, uh, Mikhail Yuzhny, and a uh, very, very short stint with Jamie Delgado. Now, Delgado to uh, this comment's point, is a very different dynamic to Polanski. Delgado is a coach's coach, and you bring him in because he's a coach, and he's there to coach you. Polanski, it's, uh, it's a friend. And I, I think of something like, you know, when, when Francis Tiafo brought in Wayne Ferreira. Wayne Ferreira is a no-nonsense guy who... Had a, has an incredible resume, 
you know, a coaching resume. When he comes in, he's an older guy, very far apart in age, and he's going to crack the whip. He's going to crack the whip. He took away, and you know, famously, he took away Francis's phone, essentially. He's like, Francis, when, when you go for your run, no music allowed. Do you think Francis liked that? God, that sounds horrendous. I, I hate running in the first place, but running without music, nothing can be worse than that. But Wayne Ferreira is in a position of respect, and Tiafo is in a position of, hey man, make me better. I'll do what you tell me to do. Uh, isn't that happening in Ted Lasso right now? Uh, you have, uh, you have, what's his name? I'm going to blank on all the names. You have Jamie Tart, uh, uh, basically surrendering himself to the other guy. Crap. I forget his name. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's the kind of dynamic that can be beneficial, uh, oftentimes when it, but you know, it's also, you have to be ready to do that and you have to be willing to make certain sacrifices. So do I think Shapovalov is willing to make those sacrifices? Not really. No. So I, I, I ultimately think this is a good point. I have been keeping a close eye on what Shapovalov has been saying because it's been a tough year for, from him. And I always like to look at what he's saying because my sense is that Shapovalov just isn't pissed. I don't think he's pissed off about why he's not doing better. Like I'll read you a quote from a couple weeks ago. Here's a quote. He says, um, uh, I'm going to have ups and downs, and that's just kind of the way it goes when you're an aggressive player. I just need to sort of stick to my core values, stick to my game, and know that I'm going to have some good runs and some bad runs. All right. All right. Like, he doesn't sound upset about this whole thing. He doesn't sound like he thinks he should be doing better. And that's why I've kind of taken a step back. And again, like everyone can do their own thing. Uh, another thing that Chapovalov said in that same interview is like, hey, my life's pretty good. And I'm not going to let a first round loss make me totally miserable because I'm a pro tennis player and life is good. And look, good for Dennis. Good for Dennis is... But are, are the things that I'm hearing from him inspiring confidence that, you know, he's about to make the top 10 leap that I think he's capable of making? No. And guess what? What I've done in the past, like, two or so years is kind of leave him alone about it. Because if, if he doesn't want to be a top 10 player, then I'm not going to grade him on that scale. And I just don't think he wants it that badly. And the first time this was on my radar was after he made the Wimbledon semifinal and totally dipped in motivation, did not play well for the rest of the year. And I was surprised, a little, a little bit surprised by it. But then he was like, yeah, you know, I couldn't motivate myself after the Wimbledon semifinal. And my reaction after that was like, really, man? You're satisfied after the Wimbledon semifinal? That, that's what satisfies you for the rest of the year? Like, don't you want to be... Don't you want to be doing a little bit better than that? Don't you want to be hot, holding yourself to a, a little bit of a higher standard than that? Don't you want to win Wimbledon? But, but no, I, I don't actually think he does. So I think that's what's the matter, which is how this question was framed uh, with Shapovalov. But I, I, don't, I don't like to word it like that. I'd rather say, like, why isn't, Sh why isn't Shapovalov improving every year? It's because I don't know that he is upset. I think he's content. By the way, I just mentioned Tiafo. Before he brought on Wayne Ferreira, he was content. And he has said as much. He has admitted that. He, he liked his life. He was totally chilling. And then Taylor Fritz started to, to kick some butt. And some of his American friends, Opelka too, started to kick some butt. And Tiafo was like, Hey, uh, yeah, I'm ready to do this now. So time for me to get serious about my business. So again, that's why full circle, a lot of common themes on this mailbag. I feel like there's incredible synergy throughout this mailbag. Uh, anyway, what was I saying? Oh yeah. That's why he's my Vavrinka. That's why he's my Vavrinka candidate. From Oliver. 
Hey girl, since 2021, Titi Pass has seemed to be missing the competitive fire he once had. Uh, a small way I've seen this manifest is that he often gives up completely on drop shots now. Do you think small habits like this can hurt a player's attitude and competitive edge? Yeah, I think in Barcelona there were a couple that he, that he, he could have probably hustled after. Uh, in general, I noticed this last year. I, I did. There are some positive ways to spin it, though. Tsitsipas, as a young player, was as hungry as a lion. Mm, as hungry as a lion, let's say. All right? Leave me alone with the analogies uh, or similes. And there was a downside to that, which is he tend to get overexcited with the lead. He wanted to win so badly uh, that whenever he was up break point and he had a short forehand to attack, he jumped out of his shoes and was like way early on the ball, would shank it into row 13. Like that's what kept happening to him. So he did calm down. Like I feel like he, he brought the, the heart rate down. He got a lot more zen on the court. In some ways, I think that's been really good for him. He's become a pretty clutch player in some ways. Uh, but I also think that there have been some disappointing... I don't know. Uh, there have been some, some disappointing efforts. I, I covered them last year. I don't want to rehash all of them. Where he has been losing and he hasn't fought as hard as I know he normally should or could uh, to try to get back in the match. So... There have been some disappointing efforts. I think this year, though, I think he's got a clean slate in my book this year. There hasn't been a match that Tsitsipas has lost in 2023 where I really felt like the mental game has been a huge issue. But last year, that there certainly was. This next one from El Chipo. How does one become a ball kid? If I recall correctly, you were one at some point in New York City. Yep, I, I was. Uh... I don't know how it works in other tournaments. I believe there's some uh, variance here. But for the US Open, you simply sign up and you try out. And they will judge your ability to run full speed and pick a tennis ball up off the court, uh, to catch a ball, you know, to be shorthanded, obviously. And back in the day, when I was a ball boy, they also had to see how well can you throw the ball but now it's rolling the ball. So I don't know if they see your roll or if it's just a given that you can roll the ball because anybody can roll the ball. I, I don't know. But uh, yeah, you just try out. That's it. Next one is from small kid who doesn't know how to fight. Also a member. Appreciate it. Uh, what are your thoughts on best of five returning in finals of Masters events and World Tour finals? I know the fatigue argument exists, but for the World Tour finals, I can't see how it's relevant. We got some epics like the Rome 2005 and 2006 finals, and I'd like to see it return. If you make Masters two weeks, might as well go all the way. LOL. Well, actually, I, I, for, I don't like it. I don't want it. I don't thirst for it. I don't want it. But... I feel like when the majors feel different and special, that's better. I know what you're saying. Like, if you're going to make it two weeks, let's just do the whole, th whole shebang and go to best of five. I mean, no, I, I don't think we want that. I think we want the best of five format on the men's side to feel unique to the majors. I think that elevates it, honestly. So, yeah, I, I don't look. I don't have a very complex argument to explain myself and why I don't want it, but I don't want it. Just me. Uh, from Tennis in the Park, U.S. college tennis programs feature an education in hardcourt dependence. You can go to college and see one colorfully paint painted hardcourt after another, but by offering zero surface versatility, how can these programs pretend to be preparing future pros? This is an interesting point. I've never seen, seen anybody bring this up. My short answer is, look, college tennis is not meant for preparing future pros in that way. Uh, but here's what college tennis is good for. If you are not mature enough to become an adult, to be in charge of your career, to travel around the world and manage an agent and manage, you know, all of the things that come with being on tour then you should go to college 
and you will mature in college and be more ready probably when you come out of college to, uh, to actually, again, I'm going to put it simple, be an adult. Second, uh, success is not guaranteed on the tour. It's not, but what is guaranteed is an awesome time. If you go play college tennis, you're going to have teammates. You're going to have a blast. You are going to get the college experience, obviously in education that goes without saying. So I think what college programs are generally selling is not, we prepare you to be a pro in a way that is advantageous against the field. I think what they sell is your chances of becoming a pro will not become worse. If you come to college, we are going to kind of continue to give you the chance. I do know that, though that there are a lot of college tennis players that, that do feel that they wouldn't have been successful pros had they not been developed uh, in some kind of way that their coaches were able to develop them. Um, so that that is out there. But yeah, obviously, you only play on hard courts. Uh, interesting point you make. All right. Unfortunately, there were 10 questions that I pulled that we are not going to get to uh, because I got to wrap this up. Um, I will have some post-match analysis tomorrow of the Madrid semifinals. We got some interesting ones. And as I've been saying all week, expect Monday match analysis to be dropped a little bit later on uh, in this coming week, but it will of course be out after the final. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.